morning, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this session organized by IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency on Small Island Development States Navigating the Energy Transition Crossroads. Um, as we gather here today, we are confronted with the stark reality that small island development states contribute to less than 1% of the greenhouse gas emissions, yet they bear the brunt of climate change devastating impacts. The vulnerability of these nations uh, to rising sea levels, stream weather events, really threatens to make some of these countries uninhabitable, uninhabitable by the end of the century. So urgent and decisive action to curb global warming is imperative if we are to avert this catastrophe. Seeds stand as poignant symbols of the urgent need for climate action, their resilience in the face of adversity, their unwavering commitment to the global agenda exemplify their role as climate action champions. For decades, they have raised their voices on the international stage, not only highlighting the challenges that they face, but also showcasing their national plans and commitments to combat climate change. Renewable energy presents a beacon of hope for SEEDS. Its adoption promises to revolutionize energy systems, offering not only sustainability, but also socioeconomic opportunities tailored to the unique context of these islands. From bolstering energy security and climate resilience to fostering economic development and improving energy access, renewals hold the key to a brighter future for SEEDS. Moreover, their environmental friendly footprint aligns harmoniously with the social cultural fabric of these nations, where the well being of their populations is intricately linked to the health of their nat natural surroundings. However, realizing the full potential of renewals in seeds requires more than aspiration. It demands the provision of comprehensive technical capacity and financial support. Today, we are unveiling reports as part of the small island development states at the crossroads periods that shed some light on the present and potential socioeconomic and environmental benefits, barriers, and opportunities of transitioning to renewables in seeds. Before I conclude my opening remarks, I would like to express my heartfelt appreciation to the International Climate Initiative, as well as the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and climate action of the Republic of Germany for their funding support for these reports. With that, I warmly welcome each and every one of you to this crucial discussion. Let us come together to explore pathways towards a sustainable future for seeds and beyond. I now yield the floor to Ms. Renice Handa, who is the Community Outreach Manager of Papua New Guinea's National Energy Authority for her opening remarks. Following in her remarks, uh, Arieta Konelevu Nakai, who is the lead for SEED's Lighthouse Initiative, will introduce the initiative. And afterward, my colleague Celia Garcia Banos will set this, uh, the scene by presenting the reports before passing it on to the steam panel we have assembled. Thank you. Thank you, Rahul. And good afternoon, esteemed colleagues. Good morning. On behalf of the National Energy Authority and the distinguished uh, sovereign state of Papua New Guinea, which is uh, the one of the uh, largest island uh, states within the small islands uh, development state region, uh, we would like to thank uh, Irina for uh, setting up this seminar and also for the important uh, initiative under the SEEDS uh, Lighthouse, as expressed eloquently by the Director for Knowledge Policy and Finance Center, uh, Mr. Pelicio. The Energy Transition Initiative in the SEEDS region is an urgent priority for all our SEEDS countries, and this is something that uh, our leaders have been advocating for uh, within the UNFCCC process and outside of that, and also within IRENA. Uh, 
Uh, energy is an important source of economic uh, security for all seeds, but also it's important to our adaptive and resilience capacity. Energy transition will be very critical and important for our resilience and just transition uh, pathway as we approach our continued uh, development priorities uh, beyond 2050 and into 20, um, 2030 and into 2050. And this is very important for all the SEEDS uh, uh, member nations. The SEEDS region have collectively given their support to the uh, high level tripling renewable energy efforts by IRENA. And we have also consistently showed our political leadership during the COP28 in Dubai. As our ministers look forward to the 14th IRENA assembly where these discussions will be continued. We also anticipate the collaborative efforts from all our developed uh, country uh, parties and uh, also um, um, members who have committed uh, support to continually assist SEEDS and LDCs, especially in their energy transition efforts. Uh, it is for this reason that uh, Papua New Guinea believes that the SEEDS uh, Lighthouse Initiative is an important initiative under IRENA and that it should continue to promote uh, these initiatives for all the SEEDS members and their government. Uh, it is also imperative that we call for renewable energy technology deployment and accessible and it has to be made available to the SEEDS region as soon as possible. Uh, all the SEEDS members have 2030 targets that uh, we are creating momentum towards the achievement of these targets and we believe that any effort and any initiative on the arena is important and it is pertinent that we give both our technical and political support for these initiatives. Uh, PNG looks forward to more commitment from our ministers as they gather for the 14th arena assembly in the coming weeks and we also uh, look forward to more uh, collaborative efforts amongst developed uh, developing countries and our small island states on how we can increase momentum towards our tripling of renewable energy targets, but mostly targeting uh, access to deployable renewable energy technology. Uh, for SEEDS uh, as a region, survival is going to be extremely important for us. Uh, and as part of our adaptive and resilience capacity and the need to continue um, uh, progress, uh, progress towards uh, the achievement of uh, our sustainable development goals, uh, energy will be very key to that quest. Uh, and it is for this reason that I thank Irina on behalf of the government of PNG. And I also acknowledge this initiative under the SEEDS Lighthouse. And with that, I thank you all. A very good morning from Abu Dhabi, esteemed colleagues. Uh, Celia, can you confirm that you can see my screen? We can see it as before with the sharing the screen. How about now? Now we can, thank you. Excellent. Once again, a very good morning from Abu Dhabi, uh, esteemed colleagues, and uh, thank you uh, to the organizers, the director of KPFC and colleagues for the opportunity to present uh, an overview of the, the SEEDS uh, Lighthouses uh, Initiative. I will start with a brief 
introduction of our agency, the International Renewable Energy Agency, which was established in 2011. We have 169 members with 15 states in the session. And uh, we were, the main mandate of our agency is to promote the widespread adoption of all forms of renewable energy. Uh, our principal organs are at the Secretariat, with the headquarters here in Abu Dhabi, and we have offices in uh, Germany uh, as well as in New York. Uh, the council is convened twice uh, a year, and we have the assembly, which uh, I want to highlight uh, here on this slide that is taking place next month from 16 to 18. And there is also a seeds ministerial, which will be convened the day uh, before the assembly. Moving on to the seeds uh, lighthouses initiative. I want to move this, but I don't know how. I don't, okay, maybe down here. Someone help me, IT? Doesn't matter. Okay, uh, back to the overview of the seeds lighthouses initiative. Uh, we have 41 seeds uh, and 47 partners to date, uh, having Jamaica uh, at the Barefoot College and the Green Solutions International, SKN, uh, as the recent joiners uh, as Lighthouse's uh, partners. The initiative was launched in 2014 in response to the call for action by the seeds uh, leaders. And uh, it's a partnership, uh, a partnership framework that facilitates support uh, supporting SEED's energy transition efforts. We also operationalized uh, the SEED's climate initiative uh, that is together with the Alliance of Small Island States uh, Energy Compact and the ambitious SEED's uh, climate action. As you can see on the right, we have 12 uh, priority areas and IRENA uh, directly uh, supports uh, seeds in uh, dedicated analysis, uh, technical analysis, and project uh, facilitation support. And also in partnership with uh, development partners and multilateral agencies uh, for capacity building efforts uh, uh, and uh, support on NDC uh, implementation, uh, developing bankable projects, looking at uh, end use sectors, uh, including transport, uh, leveraging synergies between energy efficiency and renewable energy. Uh, the topic for today, uh, looking at socioeconomic uh, issues, uh, the nexus with health, food, uh, water security, as well as health and gender, and how renewables contribute to strengthening climate resilience and disaster recovery efforts. Of course, statistics, data, information is very important for information and policy making. And we ensure that we are aligned with other seeds focused initiatives. We have a target of 10 gigawatt, which uh, at the end of 2022 is around 7.6 gigawatt of total installed RE capacity for all uh, seeds. We have tailor-made capacity building uh, programs, uh, which we do at regional and national levels, uh, focusing on uh, bankable uh, power purchase agreements, energy management and audits, and climate finance. So uh, as a coordinator of uh, the Lighthouses Initiative, uh, it's important for IRENA to track the progress and the impacts of the energy transition efforts. So uh, in consultation with the Seeds Lighthouses partners, we have developed uh, all these indicators. And uh, the aim is, as I mentioned, just to track and measure the impacts of the 12 priority areas and also identify gaps and opportunities where IRENA, together with other development partners, can support uh, seeds in uh, the energy transition efforts to meet their national and NDC goals. So on the screen is an example that relates to the topic of this webinar, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, relating to socioeconomic development uh, and raising awareness on job creation, gender equality, uh, and women's empowerment. So five uh, impact measures or progress indicators were developed. 
uh, looking at the existence of cross-cutting strategies and policies, uh, the number of uh, CAP, knowledge, attitude, and practices, or similar analysis that's been done uh, across all sectors. This is to measure the public's awareness, attitude towards uh, energy transition, whether it's renewable energy, energy security, or resilience. Uh, awareness campaigns, the electrification rate, uh, which uh, we know that some seeds are still uh, working towards achieving uh, uh, universal access rate uh, for their respective countries. And of course, the share of rural communities that are powered by decentralized uh, systems. So this is just the progress to date of how uh, far we've come with our progress indicators and impact measures. Uh, we've uh, done the validation for all the three seeds region uh, from the Pacific to the Caribbean and to the ACE region. Uh, out of the 44 indicators that were developed, 26 were agreed to across the region. And then there were a few optionals and there were a few add-ons. And we are looking to uh, consult our development partners in this quarter before the, we finalize the indicators and develop the case studies and roll out the whole uh, program uh, in close coordination with the uh, IRENA statistics team. I feel that it's uh, important that I highlight uh, IRENA's support for NDC review and enhancement uh, for seeds. Uh, as we know that uh, seeds are climate leaders and they have set ambitious targets. So IRENA has been right there uh, supporting them through the lighthouses and in partnership with NDC, partnership, UNDP, GIZ and others uh, in setting their targets, auditing uh, the data that they have at hand, uh, supporting in the data collection and the processes, the methodologies, as well as the finalization of the, the report. Uh, that uh, is the result of the surveys. And uh, of course, the, the creation and refinement of the, the MRVs and the indicators, uh, as I had uh, alluded to. Uh, this will contribute a lot to the transparency and uh, understanding of uh, how the, the states are mapping out eh, their energy uh, transition efforts and how to get uh, to achieve uh, their targets. Another work that I wanted to highlight is the uh, energy health uh, nexus. And this work we undertook in uh, Sao Tome and Principe uh, in, uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, where we assessed a 40 uh, health facilities and uh, we designed the different systems, decentralized systems for each of these health facilities and also the associated costs of, uh, or just over 11 million that is needed to electrify the, the health infrastructure with uh, renewables. And it's important to note that uh, UNDP uh, and the South Tome and Principe government has used this analysis uh, to raise funds uh, uh, to a tune of 3 million and uh, they're looking for more, implement uh, the recommendations from uh, this project. And uh, this activity was uh, done in partnership with uh, UNDP and uh, the Selco Foundation through the Seeds Lighthouse uh, Initiative. It's also important to, to just highlight some of the analytical work and the knowledge sharing products uh, that the lighthouses have developed. Over the year, we have our annual progress report. Uh, we undertake renewable readiness assessment. We've completed it for about eight seats. Uh, Solomon Islands uh, it was just completed uh, in February and we are working on implementing the recommendations uh, from this RRA. Uh, in coordination with partners uh, and Papua New Guinea is uh, the next things we are going uh, to, to work on. Uh, they, we undertook some analytical work on bioenergy potential for the Caribbean seeds. 
uh, our colleagues undertook uh, analytical uh, work on the renewable energy targets. Uh, and of course, uh, statistics is common to all uh, and also feeds in to the world energy transition outlook that IRENA uh, uh, produces. And uh, in parallel, we develop human impact uh, videos. Uh, we look at the food, water, and health nexus, uh, and also the socioeconomic aspects. Uh, in these slides, I have linked the the, the topics to the uh, to the video links. So when the organizers share the uh, the slide deck with you, you will be able you have the opportunity. Uh, to, to watch these videos. We've also created digital stories uh, with specific themes that uh, we are small, but strong and resilient, or in the Caribbean, we little, but we are Talawa. Colleagues, uh, that is all that I have for you now as time has caught up with us, but do reach out to us. Uh, through the email uh, islands at irena.org uh, for, for more information, or if you want to know more about the seeds ministerial in the margins of the IRENA assembly, or the fourth conference of the small island states uh, that will be held in Antigua and Barbuda in May. We are organizing a side event uh, in partnership with Antigua and Barbuda. So we also look forward to your collaboration and we are ready to answer any of your questions. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Arieta. Thank you for, for joining and sharing uh, all the uh, amazing initiatives that are being undertaken by Lighthouse Initiative. I want now to, to take this opportunity to welcome everybody and to, to, to announce how we are working on, on the, or we have been working on small islands developing states uh, and we're launching today two reports. The, um, this is a critical topic because seeds are now at the cross, uh, crucial junction where embracing energy transition offers not just solutions to their unique challenges, but also promises uh, socioeconomic benefits. Um, I think I'm having the same issue as Arieta was before. So as I was mentioning, um, uh, the small islands developing states span diverse economic, uh, um, uh, economic and development spectrums scattered across uh, different regions, the Caribbean, Atlantic, Atlantic and, and uh, Pacific regions. Uh, we have, sorry, I'm trying to, Ensure that my screen is being shared. Is this? I can see the screen, Sally. I think you can continue. Thank you. Yes, the problem is I cannot pass the slides for some reason. I don't know what's happening. If I pass here. Now it is working. Okay, perfect. Uh, apologies. Uh, despite their diversity, seeds face common challenges, uh, geographical isolation, vulnerability to natural uh, disasters, climate change impacts, and heavy reliance on imported fossil fuels. Remarkable strides have been uh, taken up on many seeds, achieving widespread electricity access yet, uh, but the quality, dependability, and the cost of this electricity vary very heavily uh, among uh, different islands. 
Uh, or additionally, some seeds continue to grapple with electricity access issues compounded by the aforementioned environmental and economic pressures. To understand and tackle these challenges while also recognizing the potential opportunities, Irina, with the support of the International Climate Initiative, ICI, has developed two comprehensive reports on the socioeconomic effects of the energy transition in seeds. Uh, the first of the reports examines the opportunities to maximize socioeconomic benefits uh, from the shift to renewable energy within grid connected setting in seats, which predominantly use traditional fossil fuels to power generation. The findings are clear. Renewable energy offers several promising opportunities for seats. Not only do they cut emissions and help climate efforts, but they're also clean and cost saving, enhancing energy resilience against extreme weather and disruptions. Switching to renewables could uh, significantly reduce heavy the expensive for importing fossil, fossil fuels, a major concern in seeds where energy costs are among the, one of the highest in the world. Job creation is another highlight. Uh, the shift towards renewable energy isn't just about technology, despite manufacturing maybe not being a feasible segment of the value chain to implement and to create jobs in, in seeds. It is, uh, uh, there's plenty of opportunity in other of the segments, including construction, maintenance, and other related se uh, sectors sectors, leveraging from uh, actual local capabilities. And we are expecting and we showcase in our analysis that uh, the uh, plans to come by 2030 generate thousands of jobs in, in these segments. Uh, and of course, also, as I mentioned before, and it has been mentioned before, the environmental and health, upside, uh, health upsides are also substantial, offering a breath, uh, a breath of fresh and air and a healthier environment crucial for the well-being of islands and communities. In this regard, recognizing these advantages, an increasing number of seeds are setting goals uh, and creating policies to boost renewable energy with their ele electricity grids, although open depend on securing enough funding. To move forward with uh, renewable energy projects, seeds will need more financial and skilled human resources through the next decade. So it's essential for government bodies, private sector players, development finance institutions to focus on sustainable financing strategies, encourage technology exchange, and work on strengthening institutional capabilities and local expertise. With the right support and resources, seeds are well positioned to integrate a large portion of renewable energy into their energy portfolios, advancing climate initiatives, and reaping the socioeconomic rewards of such transition. <clears throat> The second of the reports uh, will focus on towards equitable energy access in least electrified seats. While many wealthier seats have achieved universal electricity access, as I was mentioning before, uh, it's mostly coming for importing fuels. Some of the lower income islands still have regions without electricity or with limited connection to the grid. Uh, this economy is a struggle and are intensified by issues like poverty, food and water insecurity, limited healthcare and stable agriculture, deforestation and climate threats. These less electrified seeds are now facing a decision in their pursuit of universi uh, universal energy access to continue to depend on importing fossil fuels, which has all the drawbacks that we commented before, or embrace decentralized renewable energy solutions, which promises extensive socioeconomic gains, uh, especially for the most vulnerable areas. This is why the second report tries to shine a light on seeds with low electrification, highlighting lessons learned and successful initiatives from three selected countries, uh, Guinea-Bissau, Papua New Guinea, and Vanuatu. It underlines the transformative impact that access energy can have, detailing the challenges, uh, chances, and actionable advice for extending try to test the decentralized renewable energy strategies. The first of the case studies talks about Guinea-Bissau, a West African mainland with the smaller islands that faces economic hardships, limited electrification, and a heavy dependence on fossil fuel and traditional energy sources, all while being highly vulnerable to climate change. Fortunately, the country is rich in natural resources and stands to benefit significantly from tapping into its renewable energy potential to drive socioeconomic development. In response, the government has laid out bold objectives, planning to invest 
over $700 million by 2030. The goals include achieving 50% of renewable energy in the mix and bringing electricity to 80% of the population. For that, decentralized renewable energy solutions also are very well fitted and very well suited. The report highlights different initiatives in terms of solar PV that are bringing dependable power to remote location, increasing agricultural output, generating employment, cutting energy expenses, and promoting community growth and environment and environmental care. A small scale biomass gasification and hydro uh, hydropower projects are also benef uh, offering benefits uh, uh, and growing the economy while uh, redu uh, reducing emissions. Uh, at the same time, they're enhancing health, gender equality, and environmental conservation. The report talks about all the logistical and technical challenges in addition to the need for a skilled workforce that needs to hinder wider adoption. In this case, the report also highlights uh, examples to replicate and how to scale up this um, these initiatives. Papua New Guinea is the, another of the case study. The country aims for 70% of renewable energy by 2030. This goal relies on increasing foreign investment, particularly for power in rural areas in renewable energy. Our report shows that renewable energy projects are leading the socioeconomic uh, benefits in small hydropower projects. Uh, we have uh, esteemed speakers who, who will be able to expand on, on these uh, examples, as well as solar initiatives and uh, biomass, uh, decentralized biomass uh, facilities that are helping not only to drive growth, create jobs, provide clean energy solutions, but really support local agriculture and improving the infrastructure. And last but not least, uh, the report also highlights Vanuatu examples in archipelago of 83 islands in the South Pacific. Most of the population lives in rural areas, yet only four of the islands are connected to the grid at the time being. Despite a, cl a clear need for more energy access, Vanuatu has received relatively little energy focus aid compared to other seats. So close to three quarters of Vanuatu's electricity now comes from renewable energy and the country aims to hit 100% renewable uh, electricity by 2030. These bold ambitions uh, need to scale up from existing projects, uh, uh, for example, in solar energy, and in a small scale hydro that are making waves and not just generating electricity, but creating jobs, empowering women's agricultural business and making healthcare more achievable and more accessible. As I mentioned, the report highlights uh, not only the success examples, but uh, aspires to uh, be able to replicate in within the countries and beyond and to scale up these initiatives. To close, uh, I would like to say that collective action is needed for seeds in the face of climate change. Uh, these nations, while small, are at the forefront of uh, the lines of climate impact, and their journey towards renewable energy is not just a choice, but a necessity to survival and equity. The energy transition has far-reaching implications for our societies and economies. A holistic approach to policymaking is needed to maximize socioeconomic benefits and to address potential misalignments. Seeds can strengthen their move to renewals by sharing knowledge, training, and policy framework. It's, uh, at the end of the day, a teamwork across islands, but also across the world. Forming alliances with development partners and investors is key to bringing in the expertise and finances required in this, uh, for this energy shift. Tailored and accessible financing for renewals already in place in SEEDS is a game changer for the energy transition. And finally, ensuring that renewable energy pro projects are inclusive and adaptable for different scales and settings is essential for a fair and just energy shift with far-reaching socioeconomic benefits. The reports are available in Irina's site, irina.org slash publication. I would like to, again, extend my uh, gratitude to Iki uh, for contributing to, to this report. And I leave the floor now to Diptika Bagela, manager from Hydropower, uh, Hydro Empower Net, Empowerment Network, HPNet, to moderate a very, very interesting panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Celia. I'm assuming my camera and audio are working fine. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to this panel and uh, introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, we're very fortunate 
to have energy transition experts from all three geographic regions of SIDS. If you have questions for the panelists, you can post them in the question answer box and time permitting, we will try to answer them. Um, I'd like to briefly introduce each of them. Haiduki Shiozawa is the team leader of the Pacific Island Nations program team at the Ocean Policy Research Institute of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, where he facilitates Japanese cooperation for advancing socioeconomic initiatives in the Pacific Islands. Jordan Thompson serves as the executive director of the Nazarene Mission Services, which includes the Kujdi Nazarene Mission Station the Nazarene General Hospital, and the Nazarene College of Nursing in Papua New Guinea, all of which are powered by a hydro mini grid established and maintained uh, under Jordan's supervision. Ms. Nima Ferreira is the Chief Lusophone Compact Coordinator for the African Development Bank Group, currently mobilizing the AFDB's private sector development agenda, partners, and members in the six Portuguese countries of Africa. Laura Diaz is a senior associate with the Rocky Mountain Institute's Climate Finance Access Network, a catalytic climate capital, and the Women in Renewable Energy Network, focused on capacity development and communities of practice in the Caribbean. Rochelle Johnson is an energy specialist for the World Bank, working in the Caribbean on investment operations, technical assistance, and regulatory policies. And Roger Salant is the team leader for the Asia Pacific region at the company Trauma Techno Ambiente, which um, he has wide ranging experience from high level policy support and energy planning to detailed engineering design and construction supervision. Our panelists uh, also represent both of the SIDS contexts featured in our two reports, namely SIDS that have achieved universal electrification yet rely on imported fossil fuels and SIDS that remain significantly unelectrified. And the transition to clean energy in each of these has distinct um, socioeconomic opportunities. So let's start with the latter context, going to the highlands of Papua New Guinea, one of the least electrified small island developing states with a national electrification rate of um, less than 20% and even less in rural areas, yet it has immense renewable energy potential and active practitioners who, who have already proven for decades the immense socioeconomic benefits that result from energy access using renewables, one of those being Jordan Thompson. So Jordan, I'd like to ask you, um, you know, the nexus of um, access to healthcare and access to energy has become increasingly important for meeting the 2030 SDG goals. And your organization has been providing comprehensive health care in one of the most marginalized remote regions of the country for over 50 years. Um, using um, a renewable energy system, an off-grid system uh, that powers uh, the Nazarene General Hospital uh, since 1967. Could you please share with us the socioeconomic impact generated by the hospital in terms of job creation, income generation, women's empowerment, and, and maybe environmental benefits stemming from uh, health care enabled by the renewable energy system and and if you could also share any challenges you faced in establishing and maintaining the system and and how they were overcome yeah uh dp thanks i appreciate it and i appreciate the opportunity this is my first uh arena event and so it's, it's a great honor to be be here on this panel and, and, and to share um first i gotta say that um well uh there is a socioeconomic benefit to our healthcare and to the hydro and the electricity. That's not our primary goal. Our primary goal um, is to speak the truth and the love of Jesus Christ, that he lived the perfect life, that he rose from the dead, that he ascended to heaven and all of this so that we could be forgiven from our sins. And so out of this truth and love pours from us Christians here, uh, a compassion and service for others. And so that's why our church runs hospitals and clinics and schools and colleges and does various community services because of a love and a compassion for the people in front of us. Um, and so as a result of those services, there is definitely socioeconomic benefit, uh, particularly as we employ people 
from areas uh, where the church is located, where the church is operating a clinic or a hospital. And as we work alongside the local people there to provide some of these compassionate services or healthcare or education. Um, getting into some of the more specifics of your question, some of the social benefits of our Hydra obviously is it provides power to critical services like healthcare in a very uh, remote rural community where power is otherwise unavailable. And if it is, it would be very unreliable. Um, and this enhances our capacity to do those compassionate ministries for education, for church building, and for healthcare. Um, also, a part of our station here is our church center. Um, so it empowers us to do more church building, which improves the overall spiritual, family, and social health of not just the community around us, but the communities that our church is, is, is a part of. Um, and regardless of what you believe, we're addressing um, issues of abuse, domestic and substance abuse. Um, and you asked about uh, women's empowerment, addressing women's empowerment definitely through maternity care, through quality maternal care, from prenatal care all the way through the birth process and through postpartum care, um, including counseling from mothers if they, if they need it. Um, and here at our hospital, uh, station with our College of Nursing and our church headquarters in the hospital uh, has almost 400 employees at this site. Um, and we're an equal opportunity employer. And so giving women an opportunity for employment in a culture where equal opportunity is, is not the norm. Um, definitely some social benefits through uh, educational opportunities. We regularly receive uh, high schools and universities who come in, we do day training and we do tours and things. We've, we've trained all of our local staff or all of our staff who maintain and operate our hydro facility, our local from, from here. Um, and so these have been with very minimal electrical or mechanical experience. And now they completely on their own without any expat influence operate and maintain uh, the hydro. And so that was all through local on the job training on the site here. Um, our hydro and our hospital also empowers community relations um, in collaboration with our local tribes here. Uh, we like to use the term co-creation and how we've come up with our hospital and how we've created various pieces of infrastructure like our hydro um, by mixing innovation and more technology, but also some local knowledge. And so this improves the resilience of our relationship with our community. Um, and the development of our community. We like to also say two-way empowerment where uh, we've empowered our community with knowledge um, and construction skills and ability to um, provide healthcare. Uh, they've also empowered us to be able to help build these things, help maintain and manage all of these things. Um, one of the things that I think we just didn't quite expect as we were um, developing our hydro and our rebuild was um, our ability then to kind of, to highlight the need for uh, ecological stewardship, particularly of the river for, for the hydro. Typically a river is just, it just runs in its water and that's just kind of a forever thing. Um, but turning that into a resource like electricity um, has given us a platform to be able to speak to our local community to say that uh, we need to be good stewards of this river and what it means to the community and what it means uh, to this land. Um, as far as economic benefits, it definitely creates jobs, uh, not only in um, just the construction of it. We had almost 400 employees just in the construction of it, but in the maintenance and operations of it, there's security that goes into that as well, um, which reduces drudgery, I suppose. Most of the employees that are involved in either the maintenance or the construction or the security of it would have otherwise been subsistence farmers. Um, the hydro itself and our hospital uh, enables us to develop partnerships with outside funding sources. Uh, we rebuilt our hydro uh, back in 2012, and that was with a foreign aid project along with uh, some, some church funding. And that's opened the doors for us to be able to go back to different foreign aid groups. Um, this is obviously a renewable energy as our, as our hydro provides renewable energy. There's no recurring battery storage system. There's no um, waste or there's reduced waste. Um, there's uh, less environmental deterioration like deforestation 
Uh, it's a sustainable technology at an affordable cost. Um, and for a mission hospital that runs on a pretty shoestring budget, uh, that's that's pretty important as our hydro our, our power plant provides electricity at a fraction of the cost at what the local power grid could, um, which lowers the total operate the total operational costs of the hospital, which enables the hospital to further keep its patient fees, which are extremely low, even even lower. Um, just for some context, like to see a doctor uh, and an outpatient is about three U.S. dollars. To have a full major surgery is between fifty and eighty dollars, um, which is a pretty pretty low cost. Um, also, our hydro has um, been able to reduce or almost eliminate the issue of losing expensive medical equipment. Uh, due to poor quality power. Before we had uh, rebuilt our hydro, we were connected to the local power grid, and uh, we were losing one to two hundred thousand U.S. one to one to two hundred thousand U.S. dollars a year in medical equipment just from poor power quality. Um, and so all of this leads to enhanced hospital services that are able to be run at a fraction of the cost. Um, Thank you. Yeah, this is um, an excellent overview. And just to give everyone an idea, like annually, there are nearly 3,000 uh, deliveries, infant deliveries at the hospital. Um, and uh, and, and the, the system is 220 kilowatts, and it's providing all of this. Um, and there are hundreds from our uh, network members in Papua New Guinea, there are hundreds of untapped small scale, community scale sites in Papua New Guinea. I'd like to move on uh, to Roger. Uh, Roger, your company TTA has supported several Pacific SIDS to advance their renewable energy goals. From your experiences, what are the opportunities and challenges of the energy transition specific to SIDS context compared to other countries? And what um, interventions, planning or intervention uh, implementation um, have had the most socioeconomic impact from, from your perspective? Um, is Roger still? Oh yeah, Roger, um, you can unmute, yeah. Hello, sorry, I got uh, disconnected for a moment. Were you able to hear my question, Roger? Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. And thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to participate as part of this panel. So, yeah, in terms of the uh, challenges uh, in the Pacific, I would like to highlight first the scale of the market, which is obviously very small, and the remoteness. And one first implication of this challenge is that uh, it leads to to high prices in general. Um, we have supported procurement processes in multiple countries across the Pacific and have encountered that uh, prices are systematically higher when compared to other regions. And in the case of fossil fuel prices, this is a very relevant aspect as uh, countries in the Pacific have uh, to invest a significant share of their budgets in fuel. And this is in turn an opportunity for the renewal energy transition because the Pacific countries have historically had very high electricity tariffs. Uh, which obviously create a very strong incentive for both governments and consumers to push for high implementation of renewable energies. Um, a second implication of the small scale of the market and the remoteness is the complexity of logistics. In this case, we have seen that uh, it is important to work with contractors with previous experience in the region because it is not easy to work in the region, especially in the case of energy access projects uh, where we are dealing with very isolated communities. In terms of opportunities, I would like to highlight the, the very ambitious targets set by the Pacific countries in renewable energies and the high interest we are seeing from donors in supporting the achievement of, the, of these uh, targets. Um, in terms of generating a, a meaningful impact, I would like to highlight the importance of piercing a holistic multi-sector approach. Um, in this, in main electricity systems in the capital cities or in the main islands, this relates to combining in a smart way both generation and demand sites. And when we aim for very high generations of renewable energies, we believe it is essential, for instance, 
to not focus the efforts only on the generation side, but also on how to integrate the electric mobility, uh, which allows us to maximize the energy demand during sunshine hours, or to integrate water pumping or water desalination. All these pieces uh, need to be considered together when we plan for an intervention, if we want to have a, a meaningful impact. Out of the main electricity systems in those interventions where we are working on energy access projects, I think this is about uh, deviating, deviating a bit from the business as usual mindset of focusing on delivering kilowatt hours to the customers and instead thinking more about how these kilowatt hours are going to be used, right? And let me give you a couple of examples of this. Um, for instance, if we are working on a fishing, on a fishing community, uh, an ice making, uh, making machine probably needs to be part of the intervention. And maybe even consider that this is the, the operation of this machine could be performed by the same operator as the mini grid. On a typical business as usual intervention, we would probably focus on ensuring the power supply and would expect that later on the fishermen uh, will invest on this ice making machine. But from our experience, uh, we see that this does uh, not always happen for a number of reasons. So if we want to yield impact in the short term, we believe it is important to integrate this as part of the intervention. A second example of uh, the point that I'm trying to make is when we deal uh, with health facilities, as uh, Jordan was explaining. Sometimes we find ourselves focusing too much all our efforts on ensuring a renewable energy-based and very reliable power supply, but then the health center doesn't have any the resources to buy, for instance, refrigerators for vaccines. So once again, we see that the, ideally um, the intervention should not cover only the cost of the power supply, but also the medical equipment to make use of this electricity that we are uh, ensuring. So this holistic multi-sector approach might seem very obvious, but the reality is that uh, this is not an easy task as both uh, governments and uh, donors are typically organized by sectors and in consequence, we are clearly see these approaches. So we think this is the way to go to maximize the impact. So there's a lot of work to be done. And in this regard, uh, in early planning stages, both from governments and from the donor side. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Roger. Um, Jordan and Roger highlighted job creation in the value chain as well as the end use. And I'd, I'd like to um, highlight Irina KPFC's Leveraging Local Capacity series and, and job creation series, where for a number of renewable energy sources, um, analyses have been done on, on these benefits. I'd like to move to Hyde Yuki. Um, considering your work on enhancing human resources and boosting community-based tourism in the Pacific Island communities, how do you perceive the impact of the energy transition on sustainable economic growth in SIDS? And given your experience in uh, human resource development, what approaches can be most helpful in developing the needed skills in the local workforce uh, to both support and benefit from the transition? Uh, thank you, Dipti. Um... My answers will be very simple. And the energy transition will drastically change the livelihood of people in communities, particularly in remote islands and also rural areas in the Pacific Islands or other seas. And uh, there will be several benefits by energy transition. But uh, in the context of uh, communities in rural areas and remote islands, the providing, providing power for all will be the key. Very simple, but uh, providing light will enable people study after sunset. Also, it will support or provide safety at night in the community. And if there are enough power for fridge in the community, it will enable uh, sustainable food supply regardless its weather condition. And also providing access to the internet by satellite, like in Marshall Islands. It will also enable people to access and provide information. And it will also benefit for disaster risk reduction. Uh, thus, uh, energy transition will reinforce 
the social foundation of communities and the Pacific Island countries and seats for sustainable development. That is the uh, answers, answers for the first question. And uh, for the second question, um, and it depends on the social structures, but the uh, key will be giving the ownership of new, new, new power facility to the communities. To do so, the, I don't know, it depends on the country or providers. The community workshops will be needed to share the benefit of the new facility, also about the electricity bill, also maintenance in many, for the many times. And also better, it's better to ask community to identify some persons, several persons in charge of maintenance. And also holding workshop, uh, workshops with those representatives from communities in some central area will be also, uh, I say, beneficial for sustainable use of those new facility. And uh, also uh, to do so, also uh, the standardization, standard standardization of equipment and parts will be also needed for avoiding confusions on the ground. In that context, uh, all the development partners should cooperate with each other. And again, I think the ownership of the, uh, of the new facility is the key. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Hideyuki. Um, yeah, it's, it's um, I, I, I smile because these themes have been so relevant um, during my time on the ground and troubleshooting and working with communities. So I really appreciate those inputs. Um, Lara, pivoting to interregional cooperation and human resource development in the Caribbean, SIDS, could you share your insights on effective strategies for local workforce skills development, again, that both enable um, uh, both enable and benefit the transition? And also, we'd love to hear about the Women in Renewable Energy Network and, and how you see the role of women accelerating the transition and how the network has created opportunities. Sure, thank you so much for those very thoughtful questions. I find that some of the, the previous panelists have alluded to holistic approaches and community-based approaches to their projects. And I find that that holistic approach really proves true in capacity development for SIDS. Um, especially when we talk about capacity development, I find that it's really helpful to think of it in stages or levels to some extent. So when we think about individual capacity development, that of the um, of the individual potential green job holder, we're thinking about investing in training and investing in education. This could be a technical course, this could be a workshop, this could be a continuing education opportunity. Um, it's very often helpful, of course, to partner with universities, with vocational institutions, um, with programs like those that I support at RMI that are meeting the, meeting the potential employee where they are. Um, how can we support you in really meeting the demands of the very rapidly changing green job workforce? And then when we think about capacity development on that more holistic level, as we were speaking at earlier, community-based solutions are crucial in SIDS. I think across the energy transition, we can all agree that community-based really local solutions are crucial. But when we are talking about the most vulnerable communities in the fight against climate change, we are really looking for hyper-local unique solutions that make sense for the community, that make sense for the geography. And that uh, community level and regional level capacity development can only really be possible through regional collaboration. So maybe that is sharing best practices between um, between different organizations, between different countries, really making sure that we are supporting networks in our local geographies. And that knowledge transfer really happens very often through programs like mentorship programs, like partnerships, like externships, spaces where you can learn from someone in your same situation. Very often, um, we, we want a local case study. We wanna know about someone who's done it in our region. So. 
I would encourage us to maybe pivot from there when we think about knowledge transfer um, and the potential for a mentorship program. I'm very, very proud of the work of the Women in Renewable Energy Network. Uh, the WIRE Network is a professional development network for women in the Caribbean. And we are really advocating for increased gender equity across the energy sector. So this is in government agencies, utilities, regulators, private sector. And something that uh, is quite interesting about the WIRE Network is somewhere where we'd like to step in is moving past the job creation space, but really looking at that leaky pipeline for women in the green job workforce. So once, uh, once a woman is in a green job, very often she is finding more barriers to her progression to leadership levels compared to her colleagues. And programs like the WIRE flagship mentorship program really support that, um, that ability of a leader or of a woman to move into leadership roles because she is not only supported by that individual technical skill development, but a network of people. Um, so just quickly a little bit about our mentorship program that I alluded to. The WIRE mentorship program is a two-year program where a woman enters as a mentee and the following year she serves as a mentor. And these peer-to-peer -peer relationships are quite special because it's um, within the region. So you are, again, learning from someone similar to yourself, but then within the group, the entire cohort meets once a month. So you are building that network across, across the board as well. So it's a really interesting kind of multi, uh, multi-level approach that we like to take, encouraging that local knowledge share, that knowledge transfer that can really only happen as you continue to support those personal relationships. You're not just developing professionally, but you have a group of people that are cheering you on on, on a personal level as well. And I, uh, I will pause there. I see that Rochelle is here and I'm excited for her to share a little bit more about WIRE as well. Yeah, Rochelle is a mentor um, supporting the WIRE network. And uh, Rochelle, yeah, so before we go into finance uh, aspects of your work, uh, we'd love to hear your experiences in mentoring women and um, and what you see are the different roles that can be held and, and need, you know, what have been the challenges and, and the areas that we need to continue to work on to promote women in the, being active uh, and leading participants in the transition. Thanks for that question. Um, so for my, my experience on the WIRE has been truly rewarding. Um, as Laura would have alluded to, WIRE provides you an unlimited source of women within the region that you can access, and it really demonstrates the power of mentorship. The reality is that women represent roughly 20% of the workforce in the Latin American Caribbean energy sector, and the participation of women is very crucial. Um, with the transition towards the green energy, there will be approximately 42 million jobs created, right? Um, which therefore requires a more diverse and inclusive workforce. Um, being a mentor on the wires has allowed me to share my experience on similar energy projects within the region, um, where it also opens the room for collaboration amongst the women in the group to share ideas and to also incorporate those feedback within different projects that we're doing as well as to provide advice, not only on a professional level, but also on a personal level. So you get to build a sister with her tribe, as Laura would have alluded to, um, that supports you along, along your journey in the field. Um, I'll definitely encourage more women to participate and to get involved. It could be like a reach one, teach one, um, it's similar to the what the WIRE mentorship program um, seeks to achieve, um, because it helps younger women to have an awareness in terms of the type of job opportunities that you can do within the energy sector. And as Laura said, it's not just limited to just um, development partners like the World Bank, but it's also from the utilities, from the regulators, uh, from the government. We all have a role to play. And with us coming together and brainstorming, we can also help to move the needle for the just transition within the Caribbean region. Um, if I could speak also in terms of from the World Bank perspective, in terms of what we're doing um, to advance the green transition and, and away from the fossil fuel 
it really requires, as the other speakers would have indicated, a multi-stakeholder approach. It requires the development partners to collaborate with the private sector, um, with the government, and to ensure that we're taking a holistic approach towards this. Um, for example, one activity that we're doing with the World Bank is in Dominica. Um, where we're working not only with the government of Dominica, but also with the private sector and with CDB, which is the Caribbean Development Bank. Um, we recently approved a Dominica geothermal risk mitigation project valued at $38.75 million, which will help to integrate the first geothermal power plant in Dominica and the Eastern Caribbean. And this will help to alleviate roughly 60% of imported fossil fuel, and we'll see Dominica being able to move their renewable renewable energy penetration from 21% to 85%. And we're trying to do these type of collaborative projects within the Caribbean, because as the other speaker says, it, it takes more than one person to, to, to really move the needle because the financing need cannot be met by just one person or one entity. Thank you. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, you you answered the the second question I had regarding finance, and um, yeah, fi finance is is so critical and um, critical to have it be customized for each of these settings. And and your points on um, regional cooperation and uh, really hit home. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Moving to finance in the Ames SIDS region, um, Neymar focusing on, again, context, SIDS contexts that are transitioning away from dependence on imported fossil fuels and, and or increasing access through renewables. Um, you're coordinating the Lusophone Compact of the African Development Bank Group. Uh, could you tell us more about this initiative and what solutions you're using to address the financial challenges of the transition in uh, contexts such as Cabo Verde and uh, Sao Tomo and Principe. And also, um, yeah, if you could also um, add a bit more on how some of these solutions could lead to inclusive growth, which uh, focus on youth and um, women-led SMEs and other actors who are needing more support to be a part of the transition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dick. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, I would like to thank Irina for the invitation. Um, yes, uh, the Lusophone Compact is an uh, initiative that was a private sector initiative that was launched in a partnership between the African Development Bank and its um, seven Portuguese-speaking countries, uh, member countries, namely Portugal, Angola, Cabo Verde, Mozambique, San Tomé Principe, Equatorial Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, and also, um, yes, um, Guinea-Bissau. So as you can see, the, out of these uh, beneficiary countries, which is the uh, African Portuguese-speaking countries, three are seeds countries, and these three countries are facing challenges um, you know, namely the you know environmental impact of challenges that they are facing daily, which impede them to actually um, achieve some of the development out that they are seeing. But uh, what I wanted to mention is um, Cabo Verde in these three seed countries are the ones that has the highest uh, energy access rate. But electricity access rate, but um, remain in imported fossil fuels and being um, fossil fuels are the primary energy source. The government has um, put in, in place enormous effort in terms of uh, diversifying the energy mix and de decarbonizing this each sector. This includes um, electricity, transport, agriculture, and inland shipping sectors. So the country has um, the decarbonization strategy included in the national development program and electricity mobility policy charter in place. And even a pilot EV project, you know, an electricity vehicle project um, that is ongoing in the country. So in order, in order for the bank, uh, in order for us, 
the bank, African Development Bank, to help the country, uh, the government in putting in place those efforts. We are uh, negotiating, engage with the government in a technical system program to help them to expand electricity vehicle charging and then also developing the baseline studies to ascertain the potential to produce and use a green hydrogen in the in Cabo Verde. So um, I also wanted to mention that the bank uh, in the past financed the Cabiolica wind farm, um, farm in the country, which is, um, and then we are in the process of financing its expansion. Uh, Cabiolica wind farm cover 40% of the country's uh, current energy demand. And beside the obvious you know, climate impact, the wind farm has generated economic growth jobs and also improve the income of the couple of virgins, uh, in benefit of the couple of virgins. This is an ongoing effort. The development has an ambition to reach 100% um, energy mix, uh, relying on a, um, renewable energy. And then the bank is committed to support the country. On the sentiment principle side, um, which is uh, one of the countries that we have uh, under the Lusophone Compact with less uh, um, access rate, um, Santome, the, the low electricity access rate is a result of inefficiency in the in the power sector, which costs about the four percent of GDP um, per year to the government. So strengthening the power sector is therefore an important pillar of economic growth, as the weak financial health of the electricity sector has underpinned undermined the government effort to attract private investor to augment generational capacity. So as I explained in the beginning, Lusophone Compact is a private sector initiative. So our all the intervention that we have um, at the country's level, the, 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 the objective is to spur private sector investor, crowd in private sector investor investment into critical sectors, in this case, energy sector or in these two countries. As a result, um, for sentiment principle, the bank is um, intends to support utility transformation because the utility um, uh, operation and financial capacity is very weak. So the, the transformation is uh, through the fi financial solutions and undertaking uh, investments in addition to the bank planning the interventions, including supporting the regulatory um, framework of the sentiment principle. Um, we also have some ongoing projects in Guinea-Bissau, but I just wanted to highlight Sentiment Principe and Cabo Verde this time. So um, in terms of uh, job creation, we are the Lusophone Compact actually is an effort to coordinate the bank efforts in these countries because we realized that in the Portuguese speaking countries, there's a um, low um, private sector uh, operation, not only for the, 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 the African Development Bank, as for our, partner, our partners, uh, namely IFC, ITD, and then uh, we, we are, you know, assuming we are having, really have more partners joining us to, in this effort. So we are coordinating efforts in order to uh, bring pragmatic approach, solutions for, to support youth, and women entrepreneurship, and not only this, because the uh, seeds countries that, um, namely the ones uh, that belong to Lusophone Compact, they have a, a weak capacity to um, develop uh, a, a sizable project, sizable project that meets the bank criteria or other DFIs. So we innovate uh, through the uh, establishment of investment vehicles that will support uh, women and youth uh, micro SMEs uh, in the critical sectors, namely agriculture, um, tourism, because seats are there, they rely a lot in the tourism. How can we help them to innovate and then bring uh, um, solutions that uh, are environmentally uh, friendly? And then also an infrastructure value chain. This is where energy uh, enters. Energy is the backbone for the economic uh, development. So we believe that. Uh, Bringing entrepreneurship in this sector is crucial to help the country achieve the the the, the, the targets that they have under the seat. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Neymar, for um, those 
amazing updates. I mean, it's very clear that there is leapfrogging happening. I mean, to hear that green hydrogen is being financed in SIDS countries, he, here I am sitting in the US where there's still development happening. Or, I mean, yeah, so uh, all of what you shared is is quite inspiring. And with the uh, remaining 10 minutes that we have, I'd, I'd like to, or five, eight minutes that we have before we close, I'd like to open um, uh, to, to the panelist, uh, just this final round of, of what you see um, as top priority in the way forward and, and how you think Irina could take part in that. Um, yeah, you can just feel free to uh, unmute and share if you'd like. Sure, I'll go first. <laughs> I think the top priority, especially within SIDS, is capacity building. And I think Irina can support with collaborating as they are doing now with um, different partners to reinforce and to upscale the, the stakeholders within the government, especially. Um, so I think that's one way to move forward as we go towards the just transition within SIDS. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deepti. I can say uh, I fully agree with uh, Rachel. A lot of compact is about a partnership to uh, help the countries to achieve because uh, only the bank and only the or only the government they cannot achieve uh, so ambitious uh, development uh, program. So uh, I think that uh, Irina can we can explore how we can partner in terms of uh, boosting those um, private sector innovative solution that we are bringing in an energy space uh, to help the country to transition to 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 green um, to energy renewable energy and then also green growth. Um, uh, I will also uh, uh, you know um, stated that uh, the 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 countries like. Guinea-Bissau or San Tomé in principle, where they need a big capacity, we as a uh, development is financial institution, we need to take more risk in terms of uh, helping the countries and invest in a capacity building, capacity not only in the public sector, but also private sector, because uh, you know um, public sector cannot respond to all needs that the country have. And the private sector can bring the solution and, and can help even improve those gaps that we are currently facing in terms of energy access, in terms of also uh, bringing the bankability of uh, utilities. Thank you so much. Can I say something? Uh, Sasuka B Foundation will organize a series of seminars along with uh, Japan's, I mean, Japan Pacific Countries Leaders Summit this July. And it will include series of uh, series of seminars and also track 1.5 dialogue. So I want Irina to join our you know activities for them. <laughs> Thank you. I'll quickly echo some points that have been made. Um, especially, I really resonated with what Nima said about how energy is the backbone of all other solutions. That once we tackle the energy transition, we can really look more deeply into all of the other issues that are important to us. So I would encourage more conversation cross-sectorally. How can we make sure that renewable energy is part of the conversations across the board um, with all the other issues that IRENA is tackling? How can we continue to take that model of um, really inclusive thought um, around, around energy? So from my side, I would uh, subscribe to Rochelle's point on the need for capacity building. And specifically, since uh, seed countries have similar challenges, I think it's important to uh, share the experiences from country to country and see what worked, what didn't, so that uh, countries don't uh, try to reinvent the wheel and instead build on the capacity built by, by others. I think that is uh, important. Thank you. Yeah, I would just quickly say uh, incorporating various 
foreign aid programs, um, there's opportunity there, there's interest in that in terms of funding, but also uh, accountability and partnerships. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm new to this, and so I'm not sure if that's part of Irina's scope, but uh, there is opportunity and interest in there. Yeah, these are um, excellent suggestions. Um, I'd like to share from my perspective, uh, my organization works on localizing community scale hydropower and other non-battery solutions. And yeah, it's it's extremely important to provide capacity building to both government and private sector and civil society actors um, in ways that actually lead to results uh, on the ground. So that means combining with finance and um, having a medium term approach and not not just um, looking at how many watts or kilowatts installed. Um, yeah, and so uh, I, I'm just I'm just blown away by all the inputs that have been shared today. And um, one one uh, I, one point I'd like to share with everyone is that there, Irina has a gender survey happening right now, and it would be great to have more inputs from SID's perspectives. And Celia could maybe um, type the link for that for the audience. Um, but uh, I think it's Irina backslash gender survey. And um, uh, I think that, yeah, there there is um, not much more left to say, except a very warm thank you to all of our panelists um, joining um, during Easter holidays. And, and I really appreciate it in that context, uh, Jordan's laying out of, of the mission of his organization. It's timely to, to recognize that. And also to our panelists from, from the Western Hemisphere, thank you for taking time to join. Your, your inputs have been invaluable. Um, and and also uh, the in-between where the time zone is still um, rather inconvenient. We really appreciate you joining. And, and to the IRENA team for providing um, uh, space to, to have a discussion on um, often um, an aspect that that isn't looked at, socioeconomic and environmental benefits, how to optimize them uh, in the energy transition. So with that, um, we, unless there are questions from the audience, um, I'd like to, yes, also thank the director of the KPFC uh, to, to join and also the SIDS Lighthouse Initiative uh, to join this event. Uh, I've been admiring it from afar for a while. And um, and to uh, my team lead Celia for helping us um, uh, get to this point. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I will close the webinar with this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.